welcome to The Art of Semi-Fiction. I'm Jane Daly. And I'm Robin Miller. And today we are going to be talking about using fiction principles in nonfiction. There are really three things that I believe that are part of the fiction, what we call, what I would call fiction principles that can carry both into fiction and nonfiction. First is the exaggeration of characteristics, which we're going to discuss adding tension to a scene through conflict, mm -hmm. and then ending each chapter with a cliffhanger. I must read dun, dun, on. Dun, 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 dun. So I believe that the best nonfiction books make excellent use of story to make a point. One of the um, stories that I used in uh, my book, Because of Grace, was to give a background of what my son was like because I think it was important for the reader to know how connected he was to family. So I used a story where we lived in Montana and there were these two little boys who lived across the street in a, in a household full of girls. And they would come and they would knock on the door and they would say, can Bobby come out and play? And Bobby would say, no, I just wanna play with my sister. And these boys, you could see the wheels turning <laughs> like, what? You have a chance against What is wrong with yeah. you? Nope, he just wanted to play with his sister. So um, another book that I adore, and I do give this away sometimes when I'm speaking at uh, writers' conferences, it's called How Starbucks Saved My Life. That's a great title. <laughs> well, not only do I love Starbucks, but I had to find out how Starbucks could actually save a person's life and because so it's you know, in the title it's a cliffhanger in the title yes because if if so I'm I'm totally in but the the um, t uh, tagline is a, a son of privilege learns to live like everyone else mm. now who doesn't want that that's awesome so this the the book begins with a story from this man's childhood to give you a background of where he's coming from. He's had a wonderful childhood. His parents loved each other. They read to him. They were very well educated. And then um, it goes on to talk about, you know, what happened so, to him. So what you're, what you're saying is in these two books, your book, which is about the loss and processing of, of the loss of your, your son. Mm -hmm. um, so different than the Starbucks book, obviously. Totally. A little bit of a different subject, but both of them to build the backstory, to build the connection of um, the audience to your characters, because obviously Bobby, your son, um, is in the book mm -hmm. and it's about him, but he wasn't writing the book. So you yes. were demonstrating his character through those... Through a story. Which is fiction. I mean, it, using fictional fiction techniques. Principle. Yeah. Well, for instance, Got so if, if this gentleman, um, Michael Gates Gill, who wrote How Starbucks Saved My Life, if he was doing a how-to book, he could have said, get a job at Starbucks, work hard, yeah. follow your boss, do what they tell you to do, and your life will be better. But yeah. no, he used story to take us from how he had this wonderful childhood to a fall from grace. I guess it's going to be kind of a buzzkill if I give you the hint, but you know, he lost his very high powered job and was unemployed. And then his, he weaves in the story of everything that he learned by going to work at Starbucks, just like a, a as a, he wasn't regular even a regular person. He wasn't even a barista. He was hired mm -hmm. to clean the bathrooms. Wow. <laughs> well, is it, I mean, that, that, that to me is what we were talking about in the first episode, talking about how we build connection with our audience, that the modern day doing of that is to build relationship. And you don't build a relationship by saying, I have information, mm -hmm. and I'm just going to tell you step one, two, and three, and then follow it, and you're sorted. We, we, yeah. want, we want to know the people who are, are giving us advice. We want to know their their emotions, the process of the bottom. So what you're saying is in this, in, in kind of the modern way of writing a, a how-to almost. almost. It, is, it is almost a how-to. Because your book is, is I mean, it's, it's talking about, um, it's the tagline of Because of Grace is a mother's journey from grief to hope. So you could have said, this how is what to, I did. Yeah. How to get over the loss of yeah. a child. X number of Bible studies, read this chapter, do this, and then you are, yeah, you find hope. Find some people right. who you can relate to and you'll all be good. But no, yeah. it's, it's, it's weaving those stories. And I think uh, one of my favorite authors, Anne Lamott, 
in her mm -hmm. very famous book, Bird by Bird. If you have not, writers, if you have not read this book, you should read, this should be on your most read book. And I would even say to read it at least once a year because wow. it's so chock full of information, stories, encouragement. But she talks and her fame, of course, Bird by Bird is the title of the book, but her, yep. her famous story is, how do, you, how do you write a report or how do you write? Well, it's one by one. So she tells the story of, she says, I also remember a story that I know I've told elsewhere, but that over and over helps me to get a grip. 30 years ago, my older brother, who was 10 years old at the time, was trying to get a report on birds written that he'd had three months to write, which was due the next day. Okay. We were out at our family cabin in Bolinas, and he was at the kitchen table close to tears, surrounded by binder paper and pencils and unopened books on birds, immobilized by the hugeness of the task ahead. Then my father sat down beside him, put his arm around my brother's shoulder and said, bird by bird, buddy, just take it bird by bird. And this is her, her way of saying, you know, using that story to, to encourage writers to just, you know, one, one line yep. at a time, one yep. chapter at a time. Um, one 10 minute increment of writing at a time. Whatever it yeah. takes, whatever it takes. So one of the things, one of the, the things that we do in nonfiction uh, and fiction that carry into nonfiction is, of course, in fiction, when we're writing about a bad person, we take the worst characteristics of, yeah. of people that we know and dislike, and we add, 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 add. Um, I know you and I had shared about, I was um, sharing about this horrible person that I'm writing about and how I took someone from my past, yeah. just made him worse, just made him worse and put him into this book. And sometimes in our nonfiction, we have to exaggerate someone's characteristics just a bit to make a point. Yes. And and as you said, there's that line. We have to make sure that we're using our every bit of integrity. But um, can I? Can I yeah, just, yeah. I'm just going to interject because one of the things that I do is I, I most of my my books so far have had to do with Little House on the Prairie, real life people or some some subject. And there's been a lot of debate about those being autobiographical books mm -hmm. versus not autobiographical. And the more research that I, I do, and um, the more that I write about them, the more I realize there was a lot of stretching in there. <laughs> and what you just said, when you're, you exaggerate something to make a point, you gotta be willing to say, take, take it to a level of integrity and say, these are not, this is not true, this is based on true. Like we said, you know, all the ways that they, it can be couched, it's based on a true story. It's, mm -hmm. you know, based on real life events. Um, the Little House on the, on the Prairie books were largely based on true events, but there was a lot that wasn't true in them. And when you find that out, if you've been told they're true, so if you presented something and you said it was absolutely true, and then we somehow get to find out that it wasn't, you lost your credibility as an author. Mm -hmm. If, however, you say, I'm using some composite characters, here. So if, if the novel that you're writing wasn't, if, if it was mm -hmm. memoir and that character that you had taken a lot of that one, you know, person in your past, but you added, you know, a mean teacher and, you know, some girl you didn't like on the bus and whatever, all those characteristics there, that, that becomes a composite character. You're taking little bits of different people and putting it into one. If you said, I knew that person, that person exists, and then people find out, Actually, no, that, that person didn't. That person didn't. I mean, elements of that person did, but not all of it. Then you've lost your credibility as an author. So using those fic um, fictional techniques in building those characters, mm -hmm. it's really important for you to label it correctly and to know what you're doing. To not, I mean, if, if you have somebody in your past that is not ideal, it's easy to just think of them and go, they were the worst, you know. It was, everything was their fault and whatever. But the reality is we're more complex than that too, mm -hmm. aren't we? Well, I was um, thinking about, uh, there was a, a certain part that I was writing about my mom and it's, it's on, it's on a um, chapter called Money Talks. And I talk about my mom's reaction to, she was in a, in a home for, she had, 
think she had broken a bone or something, and so she was in a, a like a convalescent, convalescent yeah. place. While she was there, I went in and kind of took over her um, her banking and stuff. And when she got home, she she kind of flipped out a little bit. And I said, when mom finally returned to her home and routine after four weeks, the first thing she did was to call the bank and then give me the third degree. What's <laughs> going on with my account, mom demanded. This isn't right. Have you been into my account? <laughs> Mom's outrage shot from her eyes, turning her face red. Now, I don't know that my mom necessarily had her face turn red. However, that was that's a fiction technique to show my mom was mad. Yeah. Now, it wouldn't have had as much impact if I just would have said, my mom was furious because I took over her banking. I wanted to yeah. use that description of she is... She is so angry yeah. that she's... And you're painting that picture... She's ready, to, ready to burst. So you're painting that picture in the written written word. All the, the subtle things that if we had been there watching her, we would have gone, but she's mad. Right. Jane's yes. mom's mad. Yeah. But you have to be able to convey that anger. So you were conveying the truth, which is that she was furious. Mm -hmm. But you use fictional techniques in order to do to it. To do that by yeah. just the description. And there's another part where I talk about my friend, Greg, his mom um, lived with them and she got, she was very, hmm, she became kind of whiny because <laughs> they would both go off to work, she would be left home alone. Yeah. And so I exaggerated some of her complaining and her whininess to make a point that she was very unhappy about being left alone. Yeah. And so those those fictional techniques we use need to be woven into our nonfiction so that they it doesn't become a how to how to yeah. get your mom to move into a convalescent <laughs> home uh, because she whines you know it's well, it, it well, has to be well and even what you just said you use the the passage that you read you were talking about you use dialogue dialogue is is a fictional mm -hmm. technique. Too, isn't Which it? Which we're going to talk about in a in another in another episode. Yeah. Yes. Um, but it's but that's that's you're building that story, as if it, it could have been a situation that you just made up. It was just in one of your your novels. So that's where that's where that techniques all those things of setting the scene of using dialogue of creating you know, developing your characters even if they're real people you still have to develop them because we have to know them otherwise we're just telling. Mom was mad about the bank, you know, mom was <laughs> mad about being left at home, yeah. you know, kind of, you're just summarizing and there's no way that we can then enter in because even if we haven't had a mom break a bone go into a convalescent um, home, we might have had a mom who was mad or something, <laughs> some of us more than others, um, but, or, or a friend who was, or, or enter, you're entering into that experience via that story. Well, and, and that's where using those fictional techniques will make your fiction become alive, your nonfiction come alive. I was talking with a friend last night who read um, my book on caregiving, and because it's written in that storytelling and, um, you know, coming alongside you, as you yeah. had said, she said, you know, I'm not, I'm not a huge reader, but I read that book overnight. Like, started it one day, finished it the next, which, was yes it's a huge compliment but what it said to me was that she could relate she yeah. she was she was with me i brought her alongside yeah. by using those those fiction techniques of of story and <clears throat> description and using all the senses which i think i think is kind of the buzzword for for most writing right now is it is it relational mm -hmm. and you coming uh, it, it used to be that people felt that they needed to come off as an authority, right? Without I and, and I used to think, especially if you if you read a lot of um, not a lot, but some older Christian how to. I'm thinking, did these people like pop out of the womb having memorized the Old Testament, right? In five versions. I mean, they've never struggled. They've never had an issue. They just you know had this catastrophic event, but they knew what scriptures to go to immediately, and it was all fine. Well, that's not my experience. Right. You know, I didn't become a Christian until I was in my late teens, and so my faith walk has been messy. And it's and so I want somebody to say, I have been where you have been, and let me tell you, there's light at the end of the tunnel, whatever it is, whatever it is. And 
fictional techniques draw us into that we're we're walking together instead of you saying, well, I have you know I, I walked through the loss of my son and it's easy peasy just follow these oh, steps fine. and you'll be fine in a year exactly just, yeah. if you if you do <clears throat> steps one through you know, one through five yeah. And I think that that's, that's the, the key word is, is relational. If we understand that you have gone through the experience and have learned something that might help us to not avoid the problem necessarily that we were experiencing, but to walk with it and know that we're walking with hope, mm -hmm. then I think, I think you have a better chance than just saying these are the steps you need to do to get through this event or this situation or whatever. Well, I, I heard a podcast by Michael Hyatt, and he said there's three types of, um, there's three types of blogs to do. And I don't remember the third one, but one was the sage, the sage yeah. on the stage as I know everything. One was the, the Sherpa. Of I'm, I've been there and I'm going to drag you along with me. And I don't remember what the third one was, but it was more of the, I'm shoulder to shoulder with you and we're going to walk through yeah. this together. Which, um, of course, he liked the third one and so do I. I think that's the so best So do thing. I. So let's talk, let's talk a little bit about how we can use the principle of adding tension to a scene through conflict okay. in nonfiction. I have a great example of this. Um, this is a book by Susie Flory. Well, it was written with Susie Flory by uh, Michael Hingson called Thunder Dog. And if, you, if, you're, if you're on the West Coast, you know Susie Flory. Not only is she a New York Times bestselling author, she's also the director of the West Coast Christian Writers Conference. She collaboratively writes a lot of bestsellers. Bestsellers. Um, she's awesome. She's a friend of ours. She is, we're hoping to get her. Susie, if you're listening, we're hoping to interview her. Have her, have her as a but guest. But this is an awesome, awesome But book. this this scene here is what I'm talking about. So um, Michael talks about how his father met with um, the superintendent of the school because the superintendent wanted to, told, um, told Michael and his family that he wouldn't be allowed to ride the bus because he had a dog. So that mm. they, they had a... A new law that dogs were not going to be allowed on the bus and um, the superintendent began with a pronouncement the Board of Education has set a rule that no live animal will be allowed on the school bus as a board we are tasked with enforcing the rules we will not make an exception to the rule my dad stood mm -hmm. up facing the board was recognized and asked did anyone complain the superintendent answered no did my son or his guide dog misbehave? No again. The fact is, under California law, it is a felony to deny access to public transportation to a blind person with a guide dog. So mm -hmm. there's many times in this book where they use conflict, um, as well as in, in How Starbucks Saved My Life has another great example that we, we add tension to a scene by yeah. creating conflict. Yeah, you looked like you had something to add. Uh, I was just, I was just, my when we were talking about this as a as a topic, I was looking. I listed all the ways that it it strengthens our nonfiction, and that's kind of when you're saying that the tension. It it strengthens your point whenever you can draw an emotional reaction to it, or or have some emotional resonance, right? right? So that's what you're talking about. Where if if they if if that had been a telling scene where Susie had said, I went into a meeting, and they were denying something, but the reality is, is California law, and so I won. Right. Yeah. You know, what would that have been? Not, that would have been boring. Yeah, so it would have been just a telling of, this is what happened, and uh, yeah, it, w it wouldn't have had the same impact. Yeah. <laughs> we just have to acknowledge the cat tail. I'm just going to say, sorry. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> the cat won't bother us, she said. <laughs> There's no problem, she said. So but finally, anyway, okay, so tension in, tension tension in, a, in a scene is the cat climbing all over us. Yes. And humor works as well. Okay, so finally, I want to talk about ending each chapter with a cliffhanger, you know, where you, in fiction, of course, we know that at the end of the chapter, you want your reader not to be able to put that book down. And a couple of examples, one of them, I'm going back to my, one of my favorite books, How Starbucks Saved My Life. And he ends one chapter, um, he ends one chapter and he says, my heart was full of happiness I had, full of a happiness I had never known before. 
I should have known things were about to change. Now I want to read on. I want to know what changed because he paints this beautiful picture of how, yeah. how, how wonderful it was to work with a, a team of partners at Starbucks and then what was it that was going to change? And I, I, I think, I mean, we, that's, that's such a, fic, a, a fictional technique um, to create the page turner, you right. know, that, that page turner. So it's, it's not necessarily a cliffhanger, meaning that there has to be something so um, dramatic and, and catastrophically interesting mm -hmm. that, you know, you, right. because you can't manufacture that every single time. But you have to leave your, your audience leaning in mm -hmm. a little bit. So that's what you're really talking about. Right. In, in one of the chapters in Thunderdog, <clears throat> um, he, well, of course he's blind. And if you know anything about the story, he was um, in the, uh, one of the towers during the 9-11 attacks. But one of his, one of the chapters ends with, what if the lights go out? Well, he's blind. So it's yeah. not going to matter to him, but you want to know, well, you're right. What will happen to all those other people that are in the stairwell struggling to get down, you know, 157 flights? Yeah, exactly. Oh, uh, yes. We were both going to talk at the same time. Um, one of the, the things that, that I, um, I wanted to point out, using fiction pr principles and nonfiction, um, one of the things that it, it also helps us to do is to kind of guide the point of the book. When you're writing fiction, obviously you can choose what details you put in and what details you, you can't. But some people feel, and I have this, a lot of people when they're writing um, their, their personal stories, so personal narrative, memoir, something like that, you'll see them wanting to write every single detail because it happened. So they yeah. were wearing that green shirt, that, yeah. ate that you know, the bologna sandwich before the event happened. But the reality is, we just like in fiction, where you choose the details to to write about that tell the story. There's a if you're setting a scene, there's a billion details that you could put into that scene, but you choose the one that has something of value to add to yeah. your story. Whether it's a clue or whether it's something that, that is, has to be included. Exactly. And that's, that's a fic fictional technique that is absolutely crucial in nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Because, and, 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 we, and we struggle with it more when it's, when it's true, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's true. So we think we have to say everything that there is to say. But if you're writing something and your point of that particular article or um, essay or memoir or whatever it is you're writing is something very defined you don't need to write even the true details like my i my my master's thesis in a in a book that i'm pitching right now is memoir and it's the story of my childhood i could have written a lot of of details in that but i chose the the ones that told the particular story that i was was um was going for and i think that that's going to be part of building your attention too is making sure you don't dilute what you choose to write about with what isn't actually part of that story and that's a very fic um, fiction based technique mm -hmm. that enriches your your nonfiction to think i have all of the true details but i need to just choose the ones that actually build the tension right actually build illuminate the build the characters all that sort of thing which is a great way to wrap this up with a quote by our friend Jan Kern, who is also oh, an yes. author. Love Jan. She says, narrative nonfiction should be written so the storytelling is so compelling it reads like well-written fiction. I like, well, you know what? I want you to read that again because I want people to go get yourself a piece of paper and a pencil, write this down because that is priceless. Narrative nonfiction should be written so the storytelling is so compelling it reads like well-written fiction. That is awesome. Awesome. You've been listening to The Art of Semi-Fiction, where we explore every corner of the written word. I'm Jane Daly. And I'm Robin Miller. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast, and thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.